Welcome everyone to the third of our guest speaker series in the DRA 2021 series. My name is Lee Dalzell and I am the National Membership the, the, mem the National Member Experience Manager for Disaster Relief Australia. Tonight, we have the great pleasure of being joined by Brendan Barry, who is keen to share his story with you all. As a way of introduction, Brendan is a former battle tank crewman and medic, discharging from the Army in 2006. He currently works with Open Arms, MESHA, Trojans Check, and the Department of Police, Fire and Emergency Management in Tasmania, delivering mental health first aid courses and other programs including Living Our Values and Curious Minds, utilising his lived experience of trauma and recovery. He is passionate about our first responders and veterans' mental health. And, and, if, and if his story of recovery from a stroke and PTSD can assist others, his story of recovery from, then he sees as his duty as living with a value to share it. We all came to hear Brendan's story tonight, so without further ado, please join me in welcoming Brendan this evening. Over to you, Brendan. Good day, Lee, uh, and hello, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for the invite. Um, yeah, really uh, pleased and grateful to uh, be given this opportunity. Um, I first came across Disaster Relief Australia uh, earlier. Uh, this year uh, when I was delivering mental health first aid on behalf of uh, Open Arms in Northern Tassie um, and was introduced to Lee by one of the members um, attending. So as Lee said, what I'm going to go through tonight um, is a bit about me um, and, you know, I'll talk for maybe half an hour and uh, then throw it open to uh, any questions um, and you know, touching on, as Lee mentioned, uh, you know, a couple of injuries that I sustained while I was in and then the uh, impacts that, you know, they then caused kind of down the track, uh, you know, as well. So kind of as part of that, I think, you know, when anybody stands up and shares kind of their lived experience, there's always that temptation to kind of compare trauma if you like. And I think in the, the veteran world and first responder world, you know, we we do that a lot. Um, the invitation is to not do it. Um, and also when we talk about, when I talk about kind of recovery or when anybody talks about recovery, again, yeah, it's really easy to say, oh, that either person's, you know, extraordinary or, or again, diminish, you know, kind of the, the steps that were taken or, in actual fact, think that, you know, I can't do that. Um, again, you know, suspend that judgment um, because as you'll find out over the next kind of 30, 40 minutes, there's, there's nothing really kind of special about, uh, about me. Um, it was just more around, you know, the need, if you like, to uh, the, that need within for me to start to, you know, not just ex exist, but to actually, yeah, live a life. Um, I also give you kind of my background uh, in the knowledge, yeah, that there, as I kind of said, that there is no kind of special power. There's no kind of magic pill. Um, you know, it really was kind of the power of, you know, curiosity, the power of not expecting an expert uh, or accepting expert opinion, um, and really that power that having a purpose and finding a purpose has. Um, so background, I'm yeah from Tassie and now back in Tassie. Uh, in my formative years, if you like, I grew up in the centre or the Midlands of Tassie. Um, and I was really kind of influenced by, I like to talk about the four kind of blokes in my life who were my two grandfathers, uh, my father and my godfather. And kind of from them, they were four very, very different individuals uh, with different backgrounds, uh, you know, different sets of beliefs. Um, but what kind of rung true and the more that I kind of look back on life was they all had a very kind of similar value set. They demonstrated those values differently, but they, you know, really, you know, exemplified, if you like, the, the values of kind of the importance of family, um, you know, knowledge, you know, like they were all all 
willing to impart knowledge and then also to discuss even with a little fella you know the the meaning of life or you know why trees are green and why the sky is blue and you know why you know why we bet on horses and yeah all, all sorts of things um there was also you know on both sides of my family a real kind of sense of justice and again that was demonstrated uh very differently um and from a very early age uh well i think i come out of mum almost with an opinion um and you know and that was never uh kind of shushed um i was encouraged again to to use my my skills you know read you know knowledge you know to, or to find out things and also to kind of talk about it um so kind of from there i i yeah as i said grew up in rural tassie my first job was actually working in a as a rouse about in uh you know in a shearing shed and again surrounded by you know powerful uh strong plain talking blokes um and you know that looking back really kind of had an impact on me and and probably still does today um you know that i think people could argue about my work ethic but you know when something needs to be done or when you know when we really need to put in uh you know i'll be there uh but then in that kind of country kind of bloke mentality if there's you know a tree to sit under or a bar to lean against and have a beer then you know i'm just as happy there as well um and kind of from there you know tassie we've always batted above our average for people enlisting um into the defense force uh yeah and i was no different so after uh i was working for a shipping company and god knows why i was driving a company car with uh with company cash in my pocket that I had to return to the petty cash jar the following day. Uh, later that day, I I pulled into Anglesey Barracks and, and had a chat to the recruiter. Um, from there, I joined the army. Uh, and as Lee said, uh, I joined up as a tanky um, and have to say, loved every minute. The moment I got off the bus at Kapuka, I know people tell, you know, stories about how they hated it, how it was a shock to the system. I, I, again, I walked off there just smiling. You know, I, I expected it, loved it. Uh, you know, the, the DS or the, you know, the corp, the instructors were, you know, they they used and abused me, uh, you know, much to the, as, and I knew that, you know, I, I everything kind of was water off a duck's back. And, um, you know, I think they really kind of used me as, as, as the whipping boy or the whipping post, if you like, for the rest of the, platoon but loved it and I kicked on from there um you know pucker IETs and just lived the life of of a young fit soldier you know that mateship that that I think defense kind of breeds and especially arms corps and there is also something you know about throwing you know a, a group of blokes into a tank into a confined space that's hot and dirty and sweaty and stinks and all the rest that you, that you bond you know pretty quick um and loved it absolutely loved it uh what did occur in that time was that i doing hand-to-hand -hand kind of combat i uh, had a bit of a uh, we were on our knees kind of thing and i'm you know fairly kind of big bloke uh and was wrestling two people and uh my head not gently but not too hard kind of hit the ground um and about a 45 minutes later, um, I dropped to the ground and woke up with a bit of right hand weakness. Over the space of about of a week, that right hand got better and I kicked on with army life. Uh, living in Darwin, posted to One Armoured, uh, and loved it, absolutely loved it. Um, and then it was up there that I was actually walking down a flight of stairs and someone ran past and asked me if I was going to the boozer um i had a nickname at that time keg on legs and it wasn't probably even my build at that point it was uh more how much i like to put away um and because i didn't respond um he thought something was wrong walked up the flight of stairs and he described it as i looked uh wonky the left side of my face had dropped i'd lost my right arm and right leg and i collapsed on him i woke up in hospital absolutely terrified um i remember waking up and just seeing a foreign kind of land everything was white everything was pristine 
Um, and I remember seeing uh, and hearing doctors kind of and nurses talk about me, uh, but not to me. Um, I heard them kind of talking about drugs uh, and whether I'd consumed any and that type of thing. And that's when I obviously, you know, tried to communicate. And it was the most bizarre thing. I could hear in my brain what I was saying, but what was coming out of my mouth uh, was a groan. Um, and it was then or later then that I found out that I'd had a full stroke. Uh, that was caused by a bleed to, to, you know, in my brain that had been kind of caused, you know, six months prior um, and, you know, just for whatever reason, decided then to, uh, yeah, for some type of blockage to occur. And yeah, there I was. So I went from a fit, tanky, loving life, uh, you know, being a, a party animal, dancing on the roof of the Palmerston RSL, doing what all good, you know, diggers do, have a good Saturday night and get in strife for it Monday morning, um, to laying there in a hospital bed, uh, not being able to feel my right side. And what I do talk about there, it wasn't the fact that I couldn't feel my right side, it was the fact that I could feel my left. Um, and when I kind of tell this story and when I talk now to, to veterans and, you know, to other people, I always talk about how defence or and army, when it works well, it works really, really well. And when it doesn't, it's horrid, just like the, the poem about the little girl. So at 10 o'clock at night, uh, after my stroke or, or towards 11 o'clock, they called my parents in Tasmania. Uh, this was my OC at the time. Uh, they had them on a flight at six o'clock the following morning out of Tassie, and they arrived in Darwin later that afternoon, uh, where, you know, they were given the news and I was given the news that, um, you know, things were damn serious. We didn't know how bad it was, was how bad it was going to get, whether I'd have another one, that type of thing. Um, to cut a very long story short, uh, it took me 11 months of fighting, swearing, crying, uh, laughing, trusting to, uh, to, if you like, march out of kind of hospital uh, fighting. Yeah, well, yeah, because I stayed in the army fighting fit, if you like. Um, in that time, I probably experienced the lowest of lows, uh, which you know, it was only kind of matched uh, a few years later due to a mental health battle, which I'll touch on. Um, what those lows consisted of, as you can imagine it with only one right side moving, um, is not to be able to, you know, get out of bed, to go to the toilet, you know, to not be able to, you know, do anything kind of for yourself. You know, you eat uh, or you, you try and drink and, you know, stuff comes out, you know, the, the left side of the face that, that wasn't working. Um, you know, so from a self-esteem and self-worth, you know, kind of that kind of measure, um, I can tell you a, a man wearing a nappy or, and, or, you know, or a bedpan not coming quick enough, you know, that really takes you to the, to the bottom of the barrel. Um, but over that period as well, what I did see was, and kind of felt within as well, I really saw the, the good in people. Um, you know, my doctor, uh, Dr. Fisher, who some of you might now see is kind of the face, he lives in Singapore and is the face of kind of COVID response. Um, I won't say how, what he, how, what he believes the federal government are doing wrong at this point, but um, yeah, and he he was amazing. You know, he he was a human, um, fantastic bedside manner, and was just one of those personalities that uh, you know that I actually wanted to get better for. I had an exercise physiologist and a physio. You know, one uh, was you know, uh, an athlete who moved from New Zealand to to Australia to continue with athletics, uh, and my exercise physio. Uh, sorry, OT uh, was she represented Australia in. Um, I think of biathlon and triathlons and that type of thing. So they had that drive and they kind of saw it in me. Um, what I will say over that period is what I learned very quick uh, was to argue with experts. Um, I was told very early on that I'd probably be in a wheelchair for life. Um, I then started to walk uh, on a walking frame. I was told that I'd be on that for life. Uh, I was told that I'd be on a walking stick for life. 
my issue kind of with all of that is is if i didn't have you know probably those four blokes behind me with that you know that tenacity and pig-headedness and that type of thing and accepted it um i'd still be in in that wheelchair um you know but i didn't uh to the point where i remember kind of one time uh kind of putting myself in a wheelchair at night and dro driving myself uh to which is really hard kind of one armed in a wheelchair um down to the hydro pool and throwing myself in um security kind of caught me uh they come out and army being army i'll never forget it it needed to happen put some people shake their head at it but uh my oc who had organized and who'd been fantastic w with mum and dad uh when they came up he came to the hospital the following day and said he would charge me if i ever tried to do that again because of the danger uh that you know that was involved uh you know at one o'clock in the morning throwing myself in a hydro pool just to exercise uh you know just to get better so as I said, I kind of kicked on from there. Um, but sorry, yeah, and just kind of before that, the lowest moment from a mental health and self-worth and self-esteem, uh, you know, kind of issue was uh, I was at one point wheeled out onto a balcony of Darwin Private Hospital. Um, and, you know, for Sun, for, you know, to kind of read a book, uh, do that type of thing. And um, I was left out there. The, you know overlooked uh you know and um i'll never forget it. it was about it was kind of early to mid afternoon um and i remember and for those who've been to darwin you know it, it gets kind of dark pretty quick but a lot later than two o'clock and i was still out there um as i said at that stage you know i couldn't get to the toilet and do all that kind of thing by myself uh, i also at that stage couldn't kind of move the wheelchair on my own um and i was locked out I, I remember the distinct click as a, as a kind of orderly or security kind of bloke walked past and clicked it after dark. Um, how I was found was by the duty officer, my duty officer who came in to do a kind of welfare check and he asked where his soldier was. Uh, the hospital went into lockdown and I was found laying on the ground uh, in between the wheelchair and the railing, um, having tried to kind of throw myself over. Um, why that was, and I'll always remember that thought was, you know, I used to be up here. Um, I used to be well thought of, uh, you know, now look at me. Um, do I blame kind of anyone for that? You know, I've now, I call transferred, as Lee said, to medics and, you know, people make mistakes. Um, I just thank Christ that I, uh, I, I wasn't successful or didn't have the strength to throw my body weight over the railing. Um, and kind of from there, uh, what kind of happened there was, again, army do army well. Um, they just sent in kind of bloke after bloke from a, from a troop, from a squadron in to kind of sit with me. You know, we were, I had two blokes watching a, current, uh, a country practice with me at 10.30 every morning for, you know, a fortnight, having a joke, having a laugh, getting me out of the hospital, getting that self-esteem and self-worth back. So as I said, kicked on from there. Uh, I was hospital transferred at some point back down to Tassie and uh, and yeah, then kind of wouldn't listen to anyone, really fought tooth and nail to not get medically discharged. Um, and luckily I had a, a fanta two fantastic bosses down here. One was a, a tanky and one was a, uh, a major who'd kind of gone through the rank and then crossed over, combat engineer, um, who fought also to keep me in. I then uh, headed back to Pucker, uh, where I yeah continued as a tanky. I realised then, however, that I wasn't going to be a 40-year a kind of soldier. Um, and what I also knew was that no one in the civilian world needed a tank crewman. So I did the kind of core transfer thing. And after getting offered a spot as an MP and thinking, absolutely not, uh, I become a medic. Um, and again, loved it, loved the training. I've always, as I said before, you know, what was instilled into me was, you know, the, the value of learning, reading, um, you know, and gaining knowledge. Uh, I loved the course. I was one of the kind of new brand kind of medics with the extended uh, training. Um, and what I always kind of took away from that training, or I, I, I can't actually recall who said it, but it really resonated to me that, that the number one job for a medic is being the patient's advocate. 
Um, and I and again, I lived it. I marched into uh, Brisbane and again lived the life of well, I lived the life of Riley. I spent every dollar that I that I earned plus some, um, but I also lived the life of of, of a soldier. Um, you know that pack. You know when we'd go out. You know as anyone who's been in the police force or you know the military. You know fireys know. You know there's there's nothing stronger than than you know that mateship that is forged. You know within that training uh, and you know when you have that kind of sense of of purpose and mission and when you do things extraordinary that that you know the general joe doesn't kind of do uh from there however a couple of incidents happened and one in particular where it was a i was uh there was a sustained or prolonged assault um i don't probably need to talk about that kind of too much but what was involved was uh civilian police including uh you know like special operations uh you know civilian uh fireys um and all that type of thing who had to respond um and yeah and i was the victim of, of that assault um and you know i that was kind of on top of if you like i did a a really decent length secondment because of a couple of administrative kind of things of when i caught transferred with queensland ambulance um, and I attended a few scenes, a couple of kind of SIDS deaths and and you know domestic violence kind of incidents and that type of thing that just always kind of stuck in the back of my head because and I didn't kind of quite fit. You know, I was on the road with with Queensland ambulance, but I was a I was a uh, an army medic, um, and I think with that I don't know. I just maybe had a different kind of skill set as well as a different thought kind of pattern in there as well. I wanted to go in hard with the coppers, but then also do, you know, the AMBO work as well. Um, I'll never forget there was kind of one incident, and this is what really, again, brought home that passion of of looking after people was we attended a scene and and which was probably what well, was disturbing for, for everyone. And I just remember sitting on the curb you know my pristine which weren't pristine anymore kind of whites uh with you know gunk and blood and stuff on my knees that i'd knelt in and and i was sitting next to a copper on the curb who had his head in his hands and just kind of thought you know this is one of those moments that you don't want photos taken of at the time but it would have been you know it should have been a photo and it should have been a print and it should have been you know on the front of every paper not to say that you know how bad or what had happened in the house was how bad but but what these men and women uh do on a daily basis you know these coppers and and ambos you know walk in and out of um you know and then on top of that you know what we do as soldiers when we deploy and, and the things we kind of see so other people you know don't don't have to in fact my better half uh, Alison puts it in a in a fantastic kind of uh, saying that you know she likes to live in her bubble, uh, but understands that people need to do things outside of that bubble for her to do it, for, for her to live there. Um, and I think that's quite a, a beautiful thing. And and that we as first responders, I'm I'm now a ten year ten year ten years with TAS Fire Service uh, as a volunteer. Um, you know. We need to kind of remind ourselves of that, that we are doing something extraordinary uh, for the community and that type of thing. So kind of from after a couple of those kind of incidents, I discharged from the army. I did medically discharge. Um, let's just say I was angry and uh, any chance I got, I'd tell a few bosses that I was angry and, and basically what they could go and do to themselves, which, you know, in the army or anywhere where there's some form of rank structure isn't the smartest career move. So I was uh, offered a, a medical discharge which I, which I took uh, gladly from that kicked on with life um i lived in toowoomba for a bit and then moved back down to tassie uh i mentioned allison yeah met uh it's always kind of my intent i was brought up on the movie seven brothers seven brothers where the bloke comes down from the mountains to meet a woman and sweep her off her feet and you know have millions of kids well we've stopped at two uh but what i did do was yeah meet allison at uh, when I started work down here. Um, 
and yeah, things kicked along kind of fine. Um, and then it was kind of a few years, kind of, well, we'd had one, I think I was relatively normal uh, when we had our first and then uh, and then when my beautiful daughter come along, uh, the, the wheel on the, or on the car just started to get a bit wobbly. And I use that analogy because one, I'm mechanically inept and I, um, and I ignore things probably a lot health wise and, and maintenance wise, uh, you know, so when you're in that car and the wheels that little bit wobbly, if you don't know how to fix it yourself, you just kind of wait for the next service. And that's what I was, I kind of did. Uh, I, I was too close to the problem and I could just steer that little bit kind of that way and keep on track. Um, and what I kind of didn't have was someone, you know, behind me in another car flashing their lights to say, pull over and, you know, you, you need help. Um, you know, you're in some strife. Um, and then the wheels really started to come off. And what that kind of looked like, you know, for me uh, was, you know, um, alcohol intake kind of went kind of through the roof. And I, and I talk about that in the context of, you know, I, I was drinking for all the wrong reasons. You know, I was drinking to hide. I was drinking to, you know, forget. Um, I was drinking just to, just to elevate myself kind of out of the crap, uh, not knowing that the kind of the crap kind of elevates as well. Um, and then when you stop to drink, the crap just comes back down and it's back at eye level. Um, there was also then an apathy as well, just that not caring. Um, and I have to say, and I know this isn't trendy, especially when you talk with kind of veterans, veteran groups and that type of thing as well, but um, the pension made it easy to not, you know, to quit work and and not, you know, kind of put in. And when I say that, you know, life. Um, I basically didn't give it a go, you know. I, I decided that, well, myself, and it was probably a hard kind of conversation to have, but Alice and myself kind of sat there and, and went, well, we can kind of do this, you know. I get this much money a fortnight, the mortgage is this much, we won't be going, able to go on a holiday. You know, but but that's OK, we can get through and just kind of this horrible acceptance of, you know, it is what it is. And, you know, listening to different uh, experts, um, you know, it was, you know, this is what it is, mate. And what you went through was horrific. And of course, you've got to have PTSD and, you know, PTSD is forever. Um, and kind of with that, that negativity and apathy and anger, it just feeds itself, you know. Um, and I just kind of accepted it. You know, I went out and bought the the hoodie, dysfunctional veteran, leave me alone. You know, the fact that that's a brand in itself is shocking. Um, and the fact I spent 60 or $70 on that hoodie is even worse. Um, and, you know, kind of from that, you know, it, 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 I was just lost. I, I didn't kind of know kind of where to, you know, what was out there, what, you know, where to kind of go. Um, you know, I had a GP, I was seeing a psychiatrist who was just kind of feeding me, you know, more and more medication Then I was self-medicating with more medication and alcohol and, you know, all that type of thing and didn't have uh, anyone kind of in my corner, um, if you like, for a good while. And, I, and I'll always remember, you know, I kind of continued reading and I'd heard somewhere or read somewhere that you're the average of the five people you hang around the most. And I'll never forget, I was in a local hotel down here and it was at about 10 to 11 in the morning and I was on my second schooner and there happened to be five people in the bar and I looked around, I won't say the town that I live in, but I looked around at these five people at 10 to 11 in the morning and thought, Jesus, if I'm the average of these people, I am in strife. So kind of from there, I went, all right, I've, I'm getting better. Um, and what that looked like for me, because as I said, I couldn't rely on on kind of, you know, experts. And, and you know, I tried a couple of psychologists and, you know, for whatever reason, any time that kind of challenged me or, you know, just didn't click, I'd never go back and wouldn't make another, another appointment. Um, and yeah, so kind of from there, I, I started to read prolifically kind of again and I'd go to the pub then and, and boost the average of my of the five by reading you know books on kind of anything and everything you know psychology textbooks biographies um, you know just just stories about people getting better and all of a sudden the 
the five people that I was hanging around the most were, you know, Maslow, uh, you know, uh, Russ Harris, um, you know, Paul Coelho and, and all these authors. And I, and I started to started to believe that I could kind of get better. Um, one of the biggest turning points as well, uh, if you like, and, and it really resonated with me was we, we went on um, of the lifestyle program with open arms and I think they are run every around every state and it's a kind of residential program where your partner goes with you and that was kind of the first time facilitated discussions where I realized as much as Alice and myself had spoke about different things and you know kind of recalling obviously it wasn't you know a fantastic kind of space that we were kind of in but I realized the impact of my mental health and then on top of that the behavior that I attributed attributed to my mental health had on her um, and I was already kind of plugged in to head over to Austin Hospital in Melbourne um, but that really you know kind of gave me that that kick in gear you know here was this woman with a, a backbone of steel or you know tough as teak whatever you know whatever you know that and here I was having that much of an impact you know kind of on on her um, yeah, so kind of from there and that program, and I remember again looking at another couple of, and the I always think about group con group programs in the context of the content's great, but it's also getting in the group, uh, you know, and looking at other people. And there were just, you know, a couple of couples there like absolutely don't want to be like him. Am I like him? We don't want to be like that. Or we do want to be like that person, you know, and then, you know, kind of from there. So I ended up in Ward 17 um, and that I've always kind of said was the first step in me getting better. And what that was, was a personality. Uh, she was a, an ex medical officer that I knew when I was in, um, who was in charge of the ward, uh, who, you know, sat me down. And what she did was gave me full ownership or, you know, drummed it into me that where I was at, I can attribute blame, I can attribute, you know, everything that's happened in the past, uh, you know, and, and it was all worthy, the blame, you know, the crap that I'd gone through, you know, none of it was my fault. A lot of it could have been prevented, all that type of thing. But where I was at right now was because of my decisions uh, and what I'd been allowed to get away with and what I'd uh, allowed myself to get away with. So I used it. Um, I did that. This kind of bit is all a bit kind of hazy because I got off medication uh, real quick, which was a really hard thing to do. I was on a ridiculous amount of medication, which I'll again never forgive the expert uh, kind of for. In saying that, I know what I do need to preface that with is I'm not anti medication at all, uh, but I what I didn't do was question kind of why, why I was on it, why I was taking so much. Should I be on this? should I have stopped taking that, all these type of things. Um, that doesn't excuse maybe the, the lack of medical management uh, that, that there was there. I do think there's a space for medication, but I think that us as patients or consumers really need to, you know, hold the reins um, or the oars of the boat or whatever metaphor you want and really need to steer that ship of where we're at. And if we haven't got it, that's when we need an Allison in the corner or someone in the corner to, to fight that battle kind of for us. So as I said, Ward 17 was the first kind of step in the right direction. And then I've kind of said it, what was the next, what the next six, seven, eight steps were, was getting onto a program called STEER, which then turned into Gears. What that was or and is, is a 12 week course around emotional intelligence, the impact of trauma on self, and also the impact of that on relationships. 12 weeks, two hours a week for 12 weeks with a with a workbook, you know, thicker than the Bible that you take home and that you study, that you do, that you live for 12 weeks. Um, I'm proud to say after being on the first STAIR program, I'm now facilitating uh, what's come after STAIR, which is called the GEARS program, uh, which is a game changer for anybody who gets on it. Uh, we're at, Week seven now. This is about my sixth or seventh uh, gears program that I'm that I've facilitated, 
and you can see it at this point how much people have come along. You know, 12 first responders or defence veterans in a room for the first time actually talking and getting the definitions for feelings maybe that we've never even thought of. Like, what's the definition of guilt? What's the definition of jealousy? You know, when have I felt that? You know, or do I, you know, call it blame? So if I can say anything, uh, one, get on a Gears program, two, read about it, at a minimum, download, Google feelings wheel, get on it, um, you know, look at look at all the different feelings and, and if you don't know words, then look them up and see maybe what what kind of feelings like anger or sadness and that type of thing you're attributing to maybe, you know, something that then, because if we label things correctly, uh, then we can work on them. Yeah, if we, if I only say that I'm angry when it's actually jealousy that I'm feeling, then, you know, it's really hard to work on that anger. Whereas if it's jealousy, then we can talk about the thought that's behind that jealousy, you know, then the event, and then we can really kind of pull it apart. You know, you can do that individually, you know, you can do, and obviously you can do that with kind of a peer, um, and you can definitely do it with, you know, clinicians, you know, psychologists, mental health, social workers, all that type of thing as well. Um, what I also found at about the same time, everything clicked really quick, was uh, a mob called Trojan's Trek, uh, which again, I have to say, I've now kind of kicked on with and now facilitate, uh, the lead facilitator on the Queensland treks, and I also get out to South Australia trek as well. That's where we take men and women away for uh, five nights out into the bush, no comms, no phones, sleeping in swag, sitting around the fire. And as I kind of say, talking about common sense, you know, we talk about values, identity, you know, who we are now. Um, you know, we talk about, you know, stress, we have a laugh. Um, you know, we talk about, you know, finding a mentor, you know, finding a purpose, you know, all those type of things. Uh, we talk about Maslow's hierarchy and needs, but at that really peer kind of level around the fire and have a laugh. Again, encourage anybody and everybody, Google Trojans Trek, you'll see my name on the website, give me a call and we'll get you on, on a trek next year. Um, and kind of from that as well, and just to maybe kind of summarise to why I do what I do um, and what what I do now is, yeah, as Lee kind of said, is I'm a peer advisor for Open Arms. That's my kind of full time role. However, I'm leaving that now to go into a national position with groups, training and projects, uh, which I'm ridiculously excited about because, as I said, you know, group programs or getting people together is where it's at. You know, maybe labeling them as group therapy, you know, sends the wrong message. But if we can get three people into a room or five people into a room or 25 people into a room and they can learn from each other as well as take away, you know, some of the content that's, you know, being delivered, whether that's evidence based, whether that's someone with a lived experience pontificating, um, then, you know, there's a real kind of value in that, you know, and the best thing that you kind of hear after these group programs as well is that people are catching up for a coffee afterwards, you know, they're finding the, the trendy word, finding their tribe or finding that that mateship kind of again. Because I, I absolutely have the, the belief that a diagnosis, any type of mental health diagnosis, you know, it's not a death sentence. You're not going to die from it. What you die from is loneliness. What you die from is having, you know, somebody not in your corner or somebody not there to check in on you somebody not there to see that 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 wheel is wobbly and that you need to get it fixed that's what kills you because if you've got that person beside you they'll you know drag you to the gp or you know they'll lend you a book or they'll just sit there and have a coffee with you and you can bounce your words off their forehead you know or at worst they'll call triple o you know the diagnosis doesn't kill you and we shouldn't be frightened of the diagnosis what we should be frightened of is withdrawing you know, from others and what we should, us who are well, what we should never do is, you know, turn our backs um, on someone, you know, who's struggling. We need to ensure that there's support in place. So as I said, peer advisor with open arms, I lead the Trojans, uh, the Queensland Trojans trek uh, with, and we run male and female treks with a beautiful woman, Melissa. Um, 
who, yeah, and you know, the, the whole crew on Trojan's Trek from, from the, the founders, you know, Moose Dunlop, Dogs Carney, through to who are facilitating now, um, you know, it's it's a phenomenal thing. Um, I'm a member of TAS Fire. I'm now working, uh, delivering mental health first aid. Uh, that's on behalf of Open Arms and now also uh, to Department of Police, Foreign Emergency Management, as well as other businesses. You know, what I'd really like to see is peers deliver structured training as well as informal chats kind of like this at you know brigade level station level for defense you know unit level troop level you know all those type of things just to get just to get this kind of out there um you know just to make it kind of normal you know the more we kind of ram it down people's throat i think there's there's that more kind of acceptance there um the only other thing that i really and why i wanted to touch on all those kind of things I do because what what I found what I was lacking when I was crook, uh, one from a stroke uh, and then definitely from a mental health was purpose. You know, I had nothing to do and nowhere to kind of be. Um, you know, for whatever reason, I didn't promote being the role of being a partner, you know, and parent enough um so i didn't kind of have that and what i definitely didn't have you know was any work so what i have found and and i can't believe i haven't and it's changed my life bloody ridiculously is the japanese kind of reason for living which for those who i might know it's called ikigai i probably ruined the language but ikigai look it up i-k-i-g-a-i -I -I. um and really it's so simple you know that do what you love do what the world needs, do what you can be rewarded for and do something you're good at. If we can find something, no matter how small, that meets those four criteria, that's eeky guy. Yeah. Um, it's, I've certainly got it now um, in facilitating in groups, in learning um, as well, you know, picking up books and learn, prolific reader. Um, you know, there's so many people with so many kind of good ideas you know, out there, so many people kicking goals after, um, you know, periods of, you know, periods of just badness, um, you know, and yeah, so strengthening kind of that knowledge base and then kind of imparting it. There's that, uh, there's another saying, you know, the greatest way to learn is to teach. Um, yeah, and that's what I do kind of day in, day out, whether that's one on work with clients or groups, that type of thing, I take away something you know, every day. Um, I just, I'm now a lot more curious. I listen a lot more, you know, the conversations, you know, with my kids, you know, they mean kind of so much more now. It was only uh, a couple of days ago, I walked into the kitchen talking to my fantastically tenacious daughter um, and said, you know, how are you? And, and I walked in kind of all bubbly and, oh, okay. And then, um, you know, and, oh, what are you up to? Oh, not much. Oh, how are you feeling? Oh, you know, I've just got those signs. And, and she said, Dad, what do you want? I'm not extraordinary. And I said, oh, what are you bored? She said, no, I'm not bored either. I said, so what are you? She said, Dad, I'm just happy. And it was such a beautiful moment. You know, I'm just happy. Um, and, yeah, I think that there's... There's something to that, you know, that I think is is guy as well, you know, do what the world needs, do what you love, do what you can be paid for, you know, and, and do something that you're good at. And if we can find it just for a moment every day or just for a moment a week, you know, it really kind of propels us on. So that's kind of me. Um, I can flick it back to kind of Lee. This is, yeah, it's been ridiculously, hard and easy at the same time talking at a computer um rather than people i don't know whether people have fallen asleep whether they've left whether they've um you know pointing at me and laughing so uh anyway if you've got any questions feel free to yeah kind of write them in the chat i think i was supposed to say that at the start um but thank you lee over to you thanks thanks, thanks, thanks brendan, brendan that was, that was um, um,
Amazing, Amazing story. story. I had no idea, and it was lovely to hear it. And thank you for sharing it with our members. Um, you know, it's 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 something special, and um, you have been on a epic journey, um, which you know you've got through, and it, it, it's 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 really credit to you as well, as well as your team around you. So, um, yeah, we do have a couple of questions. So I will I'll start with the first one. So basically. You were kind of inspired by books. Um, what kind of books did you get basically got you through that period? Yeah, so um, yeah, as I mentioned, so I, I, I kind of I read kind of anything and everything. Um, the biggest the Russ Harris, anything that he writes around. So he's kind of the Australian father, if you like, of ACT, Accept and Commitment Therapy. Um, and what I found, because what I did find in which uh, I can probably touch on with anyone else kind of afterwards was, you know, my battle, if you like, I don't believe, if you like, was PTSD. It was more around kind of moral injury, moral injury and my values. So he, yeah, acceptance commitment therapy it was all around kind of values. Um, the other books, Breakfast with Buddha. Um, yeah, anything by Don Miguel Ruiz. Uh, I, I just read a fantastic book, actually. I need to plug it. Uh, he's an ex- uh, Australian infantryman. I mean, he's now he's rode the Atlantic. He's climbed six of the highest mountains in the world. I think. Hopefully, it's not all. Um, he's rode the Tasman. Luke Richmond, one life, one chance. Uh, Got to get out and read that book. Um, just one bloke, and 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 now his partner doing ridiculously extraordinary things. Um, anything by Brian Tracy, Stephen Covey, uh, and Probably uh, the military book that I really kind of took away was the one about General George Mattis, No Better Friend, No Worse Enemy. Um, that was a great book as well. Brilliant, thanks. Um, OK, next question is from by Mark. Um, so he said, thanks for sharing so honestly, Brendan. You've got a book to write, brother. Have you have you done um, the assist applied suicide intervention skills training and train the trainer to help vets community um, migrate the risk of suicide? I haven't done the trainer trainer. I've done the course. Um, however, and but I am a facilitator of mental health first aid, which is the two day accredited one. Um, actually, I don't know who Mark is, but it's a great question because the role that I'm going into with open arms uh, is rolling out assist mental health first aid uh, safe talk and other programs uh, through what's called the RSL initiative and to other and, and to other ESOs um, so really yeah rolling that out nationwide um, so I can give my email address out and anybody interested um, in that I can arrange a course near you so no, that, that's that's great, Brendan. It's really, really helpful as well to have that information because, you know, um, we, we do offer courses and I think um, anything to assist our members um, is, is really is really helpful. Yeah. Um, those, another question. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Those programs as well. I mean, it, it's. It's so easy. I won't say to say the wrong thing, but it's so easy to kind of come across dismissive or to, um, you know, to, to not hear those kind of the little nuance or the the easy kind of, you know, the things that you can forget kind of pretty quick. So the more we do those, you know, that training um, and again, get used to asking those questions and for listening, uh, the better. So get on. Cool, thank you, good advice. Um, another question. So um, when you wake up in the morning, what's your first thought of the day? <laughs> Um, yeah, oh, my first thought, I don't know how much of you can see me kind of up that way. My first thought is I should exercise. <laughs> um, uh, and then I just get at it, go, go to it. Like I, I'm just, I'm really, uh, I'm in a good spot kind of professionally right now and really enjoying the kids. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my first thought. I've always been a ridiculous, or my better half will say, ridiculously early riser. So, you know, half past five kind of, that's when my eyes kind of ping uh, open. And, um, you know, maybe I'll spend a quick 10 or 15 minutes kind of reading and then I'm 
or I'm just up and shout and then doing something. Cool. And um, one more question. So what what drives you every day? Um, what drives me every day? Uh, I, I've said it kind of before that anybody who's put on a uniform, we've done things that little kids dream of. Um, and, you know, everybody wants, to, when they go out, they want to be a copper or they want to be a soldier, you know, they want to be a sailor, you know, that this is what they, or a paramedic or a fireman, you know, all that cool stuff. Um, and I saw what, I don't think I mentioned it, but my father was, sorry, yeah, a, a copper for, for 30 something years. And, and my grandfather, one of my grandfathers was as well. Um, what drives me is that these people, uh, as well as soldiers, as well as defence members, need to be looked after. We need to find a way to get them before they're either swinging from a tree or at the bottom of a bottle of whiskey. That there, there, there has to be. I won't believe that you know some that we just accept it because of the the the, the stuff that they do. That's how it has to be. Um, that is completely the wrong mentality. Um, we need to do better. And if I can do that, if I can help in some kind of way, then that's that's my job. That's that's what I love. So. Brilliant. Th thanks for that. Um, th there is one more comment. It's not a question. It's more kind of a, a, um, a statement, I suppose. Um, but it says, you said at the start you weren't special. However, it takes a special person to open up to a group of unknown strangers and be vulnerable. Thank you. So that's just a little comment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, uh, <laughs> I don't know. This, as I think I've said, once you've kind of worn a nappy and um, you know, as a, as an adult, and once you've, you know, had to put your kind of hand up and fight for it, you know, this is, this is child's play. <laughs> so it's all good. Yeah. Cool. Well, that kind of wraps up where we're at, uh, Brendan. Um, I'd just like to say thank you so much on behalf of DRA for your time this evening. Um, obviously, traditional. If we were at a live event, we would um, give you a bit of a thank you gift. Um, so we will do that, but it'll be in the form of um, a voucher for our shop, so you can get some good merch. <laughs> oh, I saw, yeah. So you should. For anyone that, that I saw the five eleven. DRA hat Lee showed me just before we came on air. Wow, that, that's cool. I'm getting one. <laughs> yeah, so so we're super excited. The, sh the shop's launched now, and um, yeah, for our members, we'll be we'll be finding out all the cool gear that you can buy on there, so you can have first dibs on the on that stuff. So <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome, and and again, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Um, for our members, if they want to contact you, um, obviously, you know, um, you're open to that and um, any kind of uh, yep. communication. Yep. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I've got Open Arms set me up with a uh, professional kind of Facebook page. Um, yeah, or yeah, give me a call. You've got my details as well. So, um, or drop me an email, give me a call. Always open for a chat. Obviously, I love doing it. So. Yeah, brilliant. And you, and you can see that, you know, in your, in, in your way you are, you know, you, you're passionate about what you do and it comes across that way. And I think, you know, through your experience and journey, um, a lot of people will take a lot um, from this and, um, you know, you, you can inspire people and, and help people um, into the future. So, um, yeah, so thank you very much for your time. And um, yeah, well, when you, when you become a brilliant DRA member and get onto the ground in Tassie, when we launch our DOT down there, we can... Um, yeah, go out for a beer or something. <laughs> That'd be great. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thanks for your time. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you. Yeah. Okay.